I was originally going to do this as a talk, and, w and I didn't have the question mark. All right, but when I decided I'd do it as a workshop, I thought I'd have to add some stuff. So what a difference a question mark makes. So um, we'll see what it's going to be about in a minute. All right, um, I guess. OK, um, I haven't really prepared 524 slides, so don't worry. I always like to start with Dilbert. Um, but the idea is if, if you want to interrupt me, it's a nice small room, then why don't you do it um, as we go along uh, rather than questions at the end. OK, so stick your hand up. I'll try and give you a brief answer so we don't go. So, OK. Um, and uh, a bit of an acknowledgement, and that's to this guy here called Stephen Johnson. Um, he gave the keynote speech two years ago at Euro SciPy um, in Cambridge, UK, not Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he's also the guy that's written most of the uh, connectivity between Julia and Python. So uh, um, he's now part of Julian Computing because he's another job. Um, so I've pinched a few things from him. Um, so if anybody was at Euro SciPy two years ago, they can leave now. <laughs> Although there's bits of my stuff in as well. OK. Um, OK, so this is a quick synopsis. The first bit is the bit I've grafted in. And that's asking the question, is Julia really fast? And if it is, then why is it fast? And can you do the same thing to Python in particular? Um, so can you retrofit um, the same thing? So I want to, and you can make your own conclusions. I'm not going to tell you what I think. So. OK, um, and then the two bits I was going to put in the original talk, how does Julia gain from its interaction with Python? And also, can you, got to, got to just get my clock on, can you, um, can you do the same um, and are there any gains that you can make actually from calling Julia from Python around the other way around? Right. And uh, I'll sketch out what those can be. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'll try and do about 25 minutes. The three workbooks, one for each section. I'll try and do about 25 minutes on each. And as I say, call me. There's only not many slides. OK, um, so Python, along with MATLAB and Octave and R, have what's known as the two language problem, which means that you guys all use Python because it's nice and easy and you like to type things and you can do it interactively. You can look at your data. You can visualize it. Everything's great. Um, however, when it comes to writing critical code, then it's slow really slow in certain circumstances. So you actually have to go to the API and write code usually in C or C++. And that's quite horrendous. There's a lot of modules, so there's a lot of people who've done it. Um, but uh, so most of NumPy and SciP and all those things are written in C. They're not written. So this is the, the two language problem. Uh, and the drawbacks are that actually it's the hard parts of the code that you'd actually like to code yourself. You're giving somebody else the opportunity to, to write the code. Um, also, very often you, you're using vectorized code, um, which isn't usually uh, that right sometimes. And as I say, somebody else is doing it for the programs doing it, even though you guys might be the analyst. So that's the two language problem. And uh, this is Eve in a in a super guys. Um, so the question is, that Julia seems to solve this problem, and it does it by compiling down to machine code. And it's not alone. Julia didn't invent LLVM. Google V8 is quicker than Julia. Uh, C Lang, which is the guy who wrote LLVM, now works for Apple. And so, in fact, most of the stuff uh, that, that you're running on your apples has been compiled using LLVM rather than 
QCC. Swift, the nice in thing for uh, iPad, I, uh, iPhone apps, is also done by the same guy. That's using LLVM. And Lua, there's a Lua JIT, um, which is getting very for embedded systems. Why we're interested in Python, developers are trying to do the same. Number um, and Parakeet are actually um, modules that you use to, act to address your code and say jitter this. Um, Piston is a couple of guys at Dropbox who have decided that they will write a, um, a complete version of uh, Python using the Python syntax and um, they seem to run out of steam. Well, I'm trying to work, tell you why they run out of steam. So if you actually look at their GitHub postings, uh, unless they just had a few w months off, uh, they seem to have run out of steam. They've done all the easy bits. Okay. Um, okay, this is a thing that I guess they probably wish they hadn't put up, but this is the, a benchmark. So these, they, they're not Julia benchmarks, but they're well-known benchmarks. Um, so Julia's down the bottom here. I've lost me pie. Oh, wait, hang on. Not to my. Well, I'll go and point. Uh, Julia's here. Okay. Um, and the 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 various benchmarks are here. Um, as you'd imagine, for certain things. So here's your V8. Okay. Go, Fortran. Uh, the baseline is C. Okay. So Python's here, so it's about 10 to 30 times slower for toy things. Um, Mathematica, apart from when you're dealing, and MATLAB, apart from when you're dealing with vectorized code, R is pretty awful. Um, you can be hundreds of times slower in R. Uh, for this kind of, but it, it, they are relatively dear, uh, dear, um well, they're toy problems. So what about real problems? This is from Stevens, I think. And he, he's an engineer, so he's done a lot of fast Fourier transforms. And for this, I'm just not seeing it, really. OK, we'll just keep pointing. Um, lower is better, because this is in megaflops. OK, so and then this way is the size of his FFT, the powers of two. So Julia's this line here. Up here is using uh, SIMMD. Anybody, everybody know what SIMMD is? Single instruction multi data. So this actually has got two data streams for one processor. So you're actually pipe lighting your data in. So these tend to be using SIMMD. Uh, these aren't, which makes this about twice as fast as, as that because you actually, your data pipeline is, is the slowest bit. Everything else is written in C and Fortran. So the question is, since Julia compiles to code, why is it faster than these guys down here? Right? I mean, it's not doing any better. It's just producing code, as is a C compiler and a Fortran compiler. And the answer is that it uses what's called staged um, compilation, which means it can make decisions along the way, and we'll see some of that. And actually, it can make decisions that a compiler can't make at the start of your code. So stage compilation, putting in macros, new things called generated functions can actually um, make it. So, so, so the, pro the answer is probably, when it comes to enterprise computing, it probably is. OK, um, this is the last slide before we look at some code. Um, so why, if you just decide that you're going to compile your Python code to machine code, isn't that enough? And it's because of some of the original architectural design features that were put into um, Python. And that's probably where the Piston guys are having problems. So I want to talk about what's called type inference, type stability, what's known as the delegation object orientation. We're chatting to a guy who thought that inheritance was the only paradigm for um, object orientation. Julie doesn't use inheritance, he uses delegation. I'll show you what that means multiple dispatch, and then stage code generation. So that's the first workbook. So we got time for some code. And I'll just make that a bit bigger. 
risky. Okay, the reason I'm actually sorry about that, guys. Uh, the reason I'm looking at workbook three is because this is running a Python kernel, Python two, which is actually actually 30 times faster than Python three. So if you're into code, however, the real reason is because I didn't want to muck up my installation <laughs> by putting Python. But you can run, you can run both. So, okay, uh, all right. We we were uh, in a different life. We were talking about inference and stability, and because this is a um, because this is a Python kernel, I'm going to have to run this. So so here is two cubed, um, and you get an integer. Okay. Here's two to the minus three. What do you get? Anybody? You do. That isn't good. If you're trying to compile code, that is not good because the compiler doesn't know what the return type is. All right, so that's what type. Now, what you should do, and Numpy gets this right, if you take a square root, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, I've not, um, don't worry, I've just not done, not done that. Okay. Um, I had it done last time. So you take the square root and you get a float. If you take the square root to minus one, you get an error saying invalid memory. MATLAB doesn't do that. It gives you a complex number. So MATLAB, again, you get type instability on that. Uh, and in fact, what you should do is... Um, you should actually take the square root of a complex number to get a complex return type. So NumPy got it right. Python, solid Python, doesn't get it right in certain cases. Um, here's another very simple thing. It's a different aspect. And somebody told this, me this was good. Um, the fact that that's a very simplistic definition of factorial. So if we take factorial 20, we get an integer. What happens if we take factorial 21? Anybody tell me? You get a long, you get a big int. And that's not good either from the point of view of the compiler, because it doesn't know what, um, what types you're going to return. So it has to allow for both types. So that's type instability. Uh, now, if we're lucky, and I switch tutorials, and it doesn't go away. All right. Um, well, this is the first one, but it's got a, a Julia. So there I say the return type of a function should only depend on its arguments for the compiler. LLVM is a very, very good compiler, but you've got to give it a chance. All right. It's going to stick in lots of code um, that you don't really want if you don't tell it what the types are. So uh, that's the bit we just run. So let's see what Julia does, all right? So 2 to the 3 is an integer. 2 to the minus 3 is an error, because you cannot take 2 to the minus 3. And it gives you a bit of a help. It tells you Julia's written in Julia, by and large. So it t I, I did have last time we could have looked at the code, but we're not going to do that now, because we've lost some time. You can go to this and you can actually look at the line uh, and see which line's throwing that error in the code. Most of Julia is written in Julia. OK, so that's an error. Um, uh, square root of 1 is um, right. Square root of minus 1 is an error in a different. Notice these are actually both in different places. And we've discussed why that is. Um, Square root of complex number is complex. Here's the Julio definition, the factorial, same definition. 20 is right. What happens with 21? Me? Anybody? What will happen if I do 21? Yeah. And therefore, since it only overflows by one bit, you get a negative number. Now, you might think this is bad. Uh, number does that because if you're going to squeeze in the LLVM compiler and make it work, you've got to allow yourself overflow. That doesn't mean that you're stuck. Julia has a couple of ways. First of all, it has a big, which will do big arithmetic all the way. Secondly, it has a, 
if I mean most of the time you're using big things when you're doing combinatorics or something like that. So it actually has a combinatorics module um, which is called factorial. If you do that, you decide you're going to use factorial from the combinatorics module, then it gives you a it gives you a trappable error um, rather than just overflowing. So there are ways you can get around it, most of the time. Why is this important? Well, is if you've got loop variables, which is what most people have, i equals 1 to 100, i equals 1 to 1,000, Python doesn't know what type. I, I might go 1 to factorial 21. So it doesn't know whether you're using an integer or a big integer. So it can't stick things in registers. OK. Um, Right, uh, I'll go quickly through these. So, Julia's consistent, but not necessarily. So, for instance, if you divide 2 by 4 integers, you get a float, which is right. But it also means if you divide 4 by 2, you still get a float. So, integer division actually produces a float. Um, if there is a, a division, Julia can use um, uh, extended characters. So, that's the same as div. Um, so that gives you a, that's how you would get an integer. You can divide two rationals, okay, and that the type of the rationals is a rational. You can divide two with the div, and the type's an integer. So it isn't that you've got two types and you get the same type, it's just you either get that type or you get an error. Okay, that's type stability. Okay, um, now, I don't know how long we'll get for this. What am I on till? Quarter past? Okay, quarter past. Mm, right, okay. Uh, well, I'd like to go through the mod ints, but I might leave something later because we lost such a lot of time. Okay, I'm going to look at uh, pulling in a module. And I, for that, I'm going to. Um, I've All right, so let's go to the right place. Okay. Uh, uh, that should be all right. I've put it on twice. Um, the load path here is where it finds modules. This looks a bit weird, but actually if you're a Linux guy, if you think of all that as USR, then actually uh, it's just because that's where OS X puts its application. So it's in USR Julia, local or USR Julia, and then it's got a site. Same sort of things you get in Perl. So this is a, th uh, a thing called modints. Um, I can't describe it too quickly because um, We've lost quite a bit of time. But the idea is you've got a, an, an integer um, based on a base. So, uh, so it, I'm using 13. So you've only got the numbers 0 to 12. And then when you get 13, that's 0 again. When you get, when you get 14, that's 1. You, so, so it's actually just, it's just the remainder when you take away the base. These are called, well, <laughs> God knows what this is doing, but never mind. Um, Okay. Why that moved? Okay. So, so that now this is the whole module. Okay. We define how do you negate, how do you add, how do you subtract, how do you multiply, how do you convert so that if you wanted to add an integer to a mod int, and how do you promote, and then this bit's just how you print it out. That's the whole module for modular ints. Okay. So here we've got three modular ints. Uh, M1 is at eight mod 13. M2 is 4 mod 13, M3 is 3 mod 13. So I'm adding, which is in the rules, I'm adding M1 plus M2 times M3. Anybody can do that in the head? No? Come on. All right. Uh, ah. 4 threes are 12 plus 8 is 20. Mod 13 is... Seven, i.e. 20 minus 13. Okay, so it knows how to do that. Uh, there's an inverse. Uh, we can ha add an integer. We can't add a rational. Okay. We, we can't add a real. But we can, we can actually... Now, so all those is what you'd expect from the module. But now is where it gets interesting, I hope. We can produce an array. That module doesn't know anything at all about arrays, but we can produce an array because the array knows. And it, so it's delegated the work 
to the array module, which is what delegation IO is. It's saying, you know, it's delegated that, and it's produced an array. And we can reshape the array. Uh, we can um, produce a vector, and we can convolve the vector with its, with its transpose times the vector, the array. All right, we can do that. There's the array. And we can map the cube function to this transpose vector. All right. And just to prove it's right, you have to look for something you can, there's a four here. Anybody can see that one? So I, I can do four cubed. It's 64. Yeah. So five, three, five thirteens are 65. So 12 is 64 mod 13. OK, so, so yeah, OK. Uh, and we can do slices. So we take the top corner. And remember that that module, there's just 13 lines of code. All the heavy lifting is being done somewhere else. So that's what delegation I always. I'm sorry it's a bit quick, but we've lost quite a lot of time. OK, the last thing I want to talk about very quickly, I don't know if I've got to get time to look at the code, um, is um, stage generation. So we start with the code. We turn it into what's called a synchronous uh, syntax tree, which is like a Lisp code. We then add typed code, which means we add what the types are, turn that into intermediate code, and then we compile it. Now, originally, Julia put in macros here. Um, at that stage, and then at this stage it compiles into code. The new version of Julia, which I've just been told number are doing, has an intermediate stage here, which is called generated functions. And the idea is you can generate better macros if you know what the types are, than if you don't. Okay, so this is a new thing which actually Julia has given to Python. So continue my looking at generated code as a way of speeding up. Uh, it's in version 0.5. Um, so yeah, so you actually got stage generations here, here, and here, which is why some of those FFTs were faster than um, than some of the Fortran. Okay, um, just a quick thing. Let's have a look. Um, just okay. So that that's the code it generates um, for one equals one. Okay, and it's not bad. This bit here. Is actually boilerplate code for the x64 uh, um, compiler. It just pushes things on the stack. So the actual code is a comparison and then setting the bit to say whether they're equal or not. Uh, and then it pops the thing off the stack. So the actual code, which isn't the overhead, is that. So two lines of machine code for that. Um, and this thing at code night is, the, is a, a macro. So um, if we look at the Fibonacci series, um, uh, define the function. Uh, that doesn't work because in this case, I'm actually saying this has to be an integer and it has to be positive. So it's a little bit more. Um, that doesn't work either because it's not an integer. Um, uh, macro expansion is just that. So it's just pump pumped in that boilerplate. Uh, the code is that, OK? Um, and I won't do the rest because, yeah. what's the point about that? Well, we can tell the compiler we're only going to work with integers. We can stick in a macro to catch the integer. It can then generate really um, tight code. Um, this bit up here is actually just the bit for the assert. And then from down here is the bit for the comparison. So actually, we're helping the compiler OK, um, I'll, I'll skip the rest because um, I've got some nice graphics in the next bit. So, um, so let's go and see if we can catch up a bit. All right, um, I've got two slides which I do want to show. OK, All right. okay um, so there's only two slides and then we go to some more demo. OK, so Julia can call. There was an example on here, but we'll see it again. It can actually call libraries directly. And there is what's called zero overhead, i.e. 
uh, just as it was with the compare, you just get a call statement. Um, um, it calls itself, so it's got to work because if it doesn't work, then okay. And then this was an example we just missed um, in the previous one. It can also call other languages, Python, with a thing called PyCall. We're going to be looking at for the rest of the talk. Um, and this is the one that Steve Johnson has done the work. I'm sorry, I'm going quickly, but we're happy to. Uh, C++, which is a guy called Keno Fisher. C++ is really hard to interface to, actually. Um, R, it's got two ways of, there's an R call and a RIF. The difference is RIF actually um, interfaces to the libr shared library. So you actually have to build your own instance with a shared instance to make it work. R call embeds a, an R compiler in the same way as Java's a JNDI, um, JNI, uh, and Python embeds. So it can call all those, but at present, the most utilized one is um, PyCall. So, uh, as I say, it was developed by Steve Johnson. It's very mature, works OK. Uh, it's used in PyPlot, which is a wrapper around Matplotlib. We're going to see some examples in a minute. SymPy, which I know is a great, I've got a nice example of SymPy for you. Pandas, although Julia has data frames, but if you're into pandas, you can use, and I think called PYLCM, which I forgot what it is. But anyway. The other thing is that Steve Johnson went down to Berkeley, to Fernando Perez is the lead developer for IPython, and in a week, they knocked up the Julia interface, and that's where Jupyter started. So well, if you're not, if you don't like sharing IPython with, um, with Julia and R and lots of other kernels, um, then blame these two guys. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we've got some more, some more examples. Still got a screen. Wow. Gosh, this is good. Okay. I, so I, I'll cut that. What I'm going to do is exercise these, certainly the bits we've missed, and I'll put them onto my GitHub. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll save that one, I suppose. Um, uh, close it, and we'll go to the tutorial two. Okay, so um, let me give you a bit bigger screen. So, um, so we need PyCall and PyPlot. So this is actually using Matplotlib to print. Um, well, let's see what it prints, sure. Uh, so, okay. so it prints that. Okay. So, so, um, so it's, uh, we, we've, we've written the code in Julia, but we've actually passed it to, to plot, and we're using matplotlib. Now, certain things Julia native libraries can't do, and one of it yet is 3D graphics. Matplotlib can do 3D graphics. So <coughs> there you go. So there's some 3D graphics. I'm going to skip. The, which is a shame. I'm going to skip the database access because he got me to switch the daemon off. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is in my book. Not that I'm plugging the book, but uh, um, I'll just walk you through it. Uh, in Python, you would you'd need this thing called M SQL dot connector. You'd create a, a connection, run a cursor, do a selection, execute a query, and then close the cursor. And that would show you a list. If you wanted to do that in Julia, but using Python as the connector, then there's the Julia. You import the connector, you do the connection, set up the series, run the cursor, execute the query, print out the list. It's exactly the same, except we've imported the, the connector as MC, and then we've sort of appended MC for the connection. So actually, there's quite a lot of, because we're saying how nice Julia is, Oh, Python is nice to Julia. There's quite a lot of stuff. Um, and I was at the last um, thing when we were talking about MCMC, and obviously that's very slow, but you could import that and run it to the fast bits. Uh, I'll, um, I'll do you one side pie. I'll, I'm going to skip this one because, again, we've run out of time. Uh, but this is a least squares fit. Um, so that's Julia. Um, that's Julia. 
uh, this bit here is Python because we're using we're using the SciPy optimization module. Um, so there's a bit of Python there. Okay, and um, so we've done that, and then we can plot the results. And there's the results, and that's matplotlib. So that's Python as well. So um, so essentially. What I did was I generated a sine wave and I had a little bit of noise. Um, so the blue is the noisy sine wave. The, um, the green are the, are the residual, the noisy points. Uh, and then the, the, um, the red is the fit curve. Okay. So just quickly go back. OK, and I think we can start to slow down a bit. OK, so just have a look at that again. Go on the next. OK, so, right, so I input this. That's Julia. Uh, this is Julia. That's where we call the SciPy optimization. You can, of course, do this in Julia, and then that's where we plot it using plot, which is map. Okay. So, Jupiter recognizes Python as Julia. Can you repeat the question as well? Yeah, what does. How does Python. Uh, how does Jupiter recognize Julia? Okay, well, it, it, well, it's not Jupiter. Pi call, if, if I think I understand it, um, yeah, Jupiter. Uh, Julia, like Fortran, is one is, is base one, okay. Whereas Python is base zero, but PyCall converts for you. So an array in Python might well, it might go from naught to nineteen. Would convert from one to twenty. My question is, all, all of you this code is not in Julia. So all of this code is Julia, hmm. but you can import Python functions. Yeah. So we imported the um, we imported with um, that. This one here, okay. that imported the uh, SciPy optimization module from the Jupyter thing, so, which is, uh, uh, but then the rest, with the exception of using that module here, and we also imported um, PyPlot. Now, that's got the plot has got put into the main, so you don't have to say. P dot plot because there's only one plot at present. Okay, so, so that's how it. Okay. Uh, right now, it's a bit more fun. Um, there's a. This was done in the Google Summer of Code, and it uses a thing called Interact. Okay, uh, and what that does is this. This is all for your Julia. It sort of puts up a widget, so you can. You can move through the code here, right? And now, it's, what we can do is we can combine interact with pyplot. Oh, sorry, I don't know why. Okay, so all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to generate a a plot, which looks like that. Okay, I can change the heading, so I'll say oh, I don't know, hello. Hi, oh, I got my thingy lock on. Uh, pi, let's have a thing on. Right. Data, London. Okay, it's a bit slow because it's queuing, so it depends how quickly I type. Um, and we can move the sliders. Uh, this 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 function was here. That function there, which is cos of a x plus sine of b x. Okay, um, so we could modify alpha, and then the code changes. Okay, uh, oh, we could modify beta. If you do it and pause in between, then it, it queues. Okay, so so by combining interact, uh, I don't know if you can do that. In, probably you can do it in Python, I suppose. I'm sure there are. But, uh, but whether you can do it that quickly, I don't know. <laughs> well, probably you can, because it's probably written in C. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, the last one, because I won't do the FX ticker now, is um, one for on SciPy, uh, SimPy. Um, so I'll just do that. I think we'll get a, okay, so sim, so pulling in the SimPy. Um, so what this is going to do is it's going to differentiate sine x squared when the star disappears. Uh, I'm using the version three kernel. Yeah, so yeah, that's it. Just get rid of that that warning. 
OK, so for instance, um, so that is uh, the third differential of uh, sine x squared. Uh, you, you can prove that because we can go down to the zero of differential in case we, we get the sine x squared. So, um, so that's the set first differential, second, third. Um, OK, now uh, up to the 17th differential. What it's done is actually stacked all those use it using the SymPy, and then it's using the Julia latex to, um, to display it. Okay, and then it's using manipulate to change it as well. So by combining the things that, I mean, SymPy is an out and out wrapper around, um, around the uh, same name, the SymPy library, then you can produce some quite nice uh, graphics. OK. Right, we're nearly there. Wow. Um, so what I said I wanted to do at the outset, uh, so that's the second book, and close that, was, oh, no, we go back to the, back to him. OK, so um, the question is, can um, can Python gain anything from interfacing with Julia? Obviously, Julia is gaining quite a lot from interfacing with Python. It's a bit more experimental. Um, the guy who supports it's in Antarctica for six months. Well, such is um, open source. So I don't think the connectivity is great in Antarctica. Um, it needs you need to install PyCall. And then the, it's quite easy then. You import and you run a thing. There are some limitations. Uh, one is that Julia can support Unicode. Python can't. So if you use anything with um, funny symbols, thetas and alphas and betas, then you're going to have a problem. And also, um, Julia has, remember when we pushed the thing on the stack, we had a thing called push exclamation mark. It's the kind of convention if you actually modify an immutable structure. You often put a bang at the end of it just so that you're, you're showing that you're changing something you shouldn't really be changing. OK, so, it, uh, and again, uh, uh, exclamation mark isn't a valid Python identifier. So it has a convention so you can still use it. All right, um, so, uh, bit more code in a minute. So why would you want to use Julia? Well, first of all, you've got access to all the base functions. Secondly, you can implement non-vectorized critical code much quicker. You remember this, it's about 30 or 40 times. But you can do it in a language you can use. And this is, you can also pull in specialist modules like Bayesian. I went to the previous talk, uh, I suppose some of you, and we were told that logistic regression uh, wasn't available in Julia. Well, it's been available for 18 months. Uh, and I had a nice slide which has gone with the dust, but Google it, you'll find it. Um, Julia's about, and I think um, the, the last speaker said it took 550 seconds to run. Julia, it would take about 20, because it's about 30 times faster. OK. So, um, so you can use special, you can interface easily to C, because it's got nice. And actually, one of the things that's coming is you can run parallelized tests, tasks. So you can get around the famous global interpreter lock, um, which gets in the way. So those are, uh, so last one, and then um, we're, we're tutorial three. So what we said is we'll bring in the Julia compiler. Uh, that doesn't take long. It's Executing this takes a little longer. OK. Um, I think I've got, did I, have I got? Yeah, I've got that running, didn't I? I think. Soon find out. OK. Um, OK, so that's worked. So I can combine the Bessel function from Julia with a, a sign function from NumPy. OK, and, uh, yep. So it means NumPy's loaded. Uh, I can also. Uh, define a range, and then um, in Python this time, because I'm on the Python, 
I can define a, a list comprehension using the gamma function from Julia, okay, um, which is done, and I can plot it. And one of the strange things about this, is that, which I don't really understand, is that um, Julia, when it's using matplotlib, puts it into the uh, Python notebook. However, oh, has it gone? We should see. Try it again, I guess. Or perhaps I didn't. Oh, I didn't run it. There we go. Oh, well, I have to press it, don't you? Yeah. Um, so uh, matplotlib in. Probably, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but you know, I mean, it, there is the the funny function. I will try that. Okay. All right. Um, so presumably the uh, Py Python interface is doing that, I guess, when it's when it's not being done. Okay. Um, right. So what else do I want to tell you? Um, series expansions can be quite slow. Um, so I'll leave that. Um, I'll leave that. Uh, uh, this is a module which I've been involved with. It's cosmology. The reason I'm going to tell you this is that um, uh, it produces uh, the, the shape of the universe. Oh, God, it is. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's blocked the thing, isn't it? Is it still right? Yes, it is. You're right. Thank you. All right. So whether or not that means this will come up, I do not know. Okay. So, yeah. So probably have to evaluate that. And then. Okay. So, um. Uh, so this returns a, a shift. The, the reason I'm showing you this is actually because um, we've defined the various curvature, matter, and radiation densities in terms of funny symbols, um, sort of latex, big omega, little lambda. Um, and so when you look at the names, you can see that they all come out relatively weird. Um, uh, this bit here is calculated. That's the... Um, cosmological constant. This bit here is um, the radiation density, which is also ca calculated. Uh, and so uh, and these are actually the attributes. So I can look at what the Hubble's constant is, because it's h. So I can say, let's have a look at what the Hubble constant is. And it's However, I cannot look at um, what these are, because the way we wrote the module is using uh, symbols that aren't allowed on the interface. Whether that gets changed is not in the front. Um, and uh, the rest of it, I think I'll leave uh, to. Oh, just <coughs> we can run it, I guess. Yeah. It's the age of the universe for this particular universe, 14 billion years. Uh, oh yeah, this one's quite interesting. If I want to pass, uh, if I want to pass the thing, I actually have to store a number on the Julia side, and because I want to print it, I also store it on the Python side. That's the redshift. Um, so, so RSJ is on the Julia side, and I've kept that, and RSP. So then I can actually call that with RSJ here in the Julia argument, and I can print it with RSP here. So, so you have to do both, and then you get the angular diameter is um, nearly 2,000 megaparsecs at a 30% redshift. Okay. Um, so that, so those are, now the very last thing I'd like to do is a, an Asian options. Uh, this I have a Python one that's in the and that you can run it in Python. Um, that might set it up while. Uh, so the idea of this is that it's it's loopy, uh, and you can't really do it any other way than being loopy. What we're going to do is we are going to um, generate a lot of random numbers. We're going to um, do some tracks, and then we're going to store all those, and we're going to take the mean, and if if the means before what we pay, then we'll, we'll add that otherwise, and we'll add, work out the option price. So uh, that's evaluated. Um, so if I time that, um, okay. So it took um, one point. Oh, the, the option price is one point six eight pence per, uh, 
for a, for a pound. And it took 33.2 seconds to do one, two, three, four, five, six. So what's that? 100,000? Six knots or is it a million? Million. Okay. So I took, well, okay, now uh, let me just quickly, and then we finished pretty well. I've just got to do wind up. Um, uh, I need a, I need a, another shell. I had the other shells, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, change to notebooks uh, slash pi d slash code. Okay, um, a bit bigger. So this is this is some of the code that's in in, in the Git. One of the things here is um, my version of what is it? The Asian option in, in Python. Okay, uh, just to prove it's true, it's a bit more. Okay, so it's, it's pretty much the same code. Okay, um, bit of a loop. Okay, if I run that, okay. Uh, No, it doesn't take that long. It does take a while. There we go. Same sort of price. Um, how many seconds? Mm. Oh, I should have timed it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Did time it. Town. So it take a little while again. Mm -hmm. So remember the Julia was what? Three point five seconds? Mm. There we go. Twenty one seconds. Seven times faster. Yeah, I have. It's 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 only a ten thousand, not a uh, hundred thousand, not a million. So that is actually seventy times slower, not seven. Okay. So that's uh, one of the advantages you would get for interfacing slow code written in Julia to Python. Seven. Is there an overhead there if you did that? Just no. Julia? No, you're actually just embedding the Julia c uh, compiler. Mm. You know. So and then you, what you've actually got to do is make sure that all the code is actually run. And that's what you have to do with MCMC or something like this to, to get, you know. So if you were doing the uh, logistic regression, you'd try and use a module and actually fill in uh, all the, the code. If you actually do bits, then the bits in between are going to be slow because the Python interpreter. So don't you do your loops mm -hmm. in Python. Mm -hmm. OK. All right, so uh, we're done, I think. I'll just um, put up the last two slides. Uh, and uh, okay, so okay, so summing up, uh, it may be that speeding up Python using will not work. You may not agree with that. That's way back before the the display disappeared. Okay, mainly because of type inference and type stability. And I think that's why the piston guys are in problems. They have to adhere to, or they want to adhere to some of the. Um, the architectural features of Python. So it may be, maybe. You know. And I, will not work doesn't mean at all, because obviously number does it, as Graham will tell you, but probably doesn't do it to the kind of speed we want. <coughs> Python actually has established a niche domain. I mean, they're now putting it on this BBC, um, yeah. Um, it's a nice, it's really a, a moved basic out of the way as a nice starter language, why kids are learning it in school, why data analysts are using it. Um, it probably, I think it's better that it stays there, but you know, these are all. Um, from the Julia point of view, Python is very, very valuable as a tool, but I hope that I showed you that there are areas where you could get away with the, if you're doing it yourself, you could get away with the C um, dependencies 
um, and, uh, and use Python instead to actually profile your code. Say 95% of my code's being written this. I'll write, I'll write a module in Julia, and then I'll just interface using PyJulia as an interface. Uh, and then there's some references here. Um, not actually, it's a, it's a shame because I'm. Um, so these are on the thing. The interesting two, and I think this is the last slide. Yeah. Uh, the interesting two are these two. Quant EconNet is an economics thing done by John Sargent, who's a, a um, Nobel Prize winner in economics, which isn't hard. I think there's only about th seven economists. So they take it in turns, winning the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, but actually, that's interesting because it actually has all the code written in Julia and all the code written in Python. So they've got the whole double branch. And they have just done a thing with the New York Stock Exchange to move the DSGE, uh, which is written in MATLAB, to Julia. So that is probably the first enterprise uh, thing. And um, if I had still got the connectivity, I'd show you the, the paper, but I won't. So, so in fact, uh, Julia probably will oust MATLAB quite soon. Um, well, it's ousted it in the New York Stock Exchange. They are, it costs you money. Have you ever looked at the cost of a license for that lab? Okay, and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah. Right, questions? Yeah, right? yeah. I'm not sure we got that long, but. We, uh, we actually, no, we do. No, that's all right. We all right. Do. Yeah. Uh, about 35 minutes left. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. 35 minutes? I thought yeah. it was quarter past. Sorry, that, yeah, the, the, as in, this is where you finish the presentation and then you have room for questions. It being a tutorial, it's going to be a bit more sort of. Oh, no, I'm happy to do questions. I've just gone a bit slower. I've, ah. run, I've missed a few no, things. Sorry. But where, where you get the good time? Well, well especially, <laughs> since we, especially since we had the uh, 20 minutes of uh, can't get my screen to work. So, anybody got any questions? Yeah? So, I mean, do you think what's the, what's the reason you would call? Ah, that, that's an interesting question because I would say once you start using Julia, for, you probably would say let's do it all in Julia. Mm. Yeah. However, um, you know, it may well be that you've got a big Python and you, you just profile it and you find you've got something you know, that, that you want to do within a Python situation, but you still want to get well, like an options or... Well, yeah, the other way you can do it in Julia, you, if you actually try and use the Python API to write C, it's pretty horrific. Because you've got the C call, you get what you can do, because we've done this, is you can write some C, compile it to a shared library, and then you can just interface from Julia with a C call to the to the C you've written, not using the Py object Py Python API. So actually you can write your C as you would write it uh, in, in a C program. Or you could interface to, let's say you've got a specialist library that, I don't know, makes arms go up and down or widgets move around. You could interface to that um, just by doing wrappers uh, around the code. Whereas, I don't know, do you ever write any um, API C stuff in Python? Yeah. yeah okay. Well, there you're a clever guy. You're a clever <laughs> guy. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yep. No. <laughs> uh, I, have I seen any integrate? No, uh, I haven't. Seen, well, yes, yes, and no. Again, it's a shame. Yes, there are modules. There's a group. One of the guys, Viral Shah, who's one of the original three, runs a group in Bangalore that's looking at all the connectivity. There are wrappers for Hadoop and for is it called YAL? The second one, the the YAL. So there is a wrapper for that. You can do that. I think there's a Spark. However, the the paradigm for parallelism in Julia is different from Hadoop. It doesn't run on the JVM, and it's different from message passing MPI. There are modules that will do that. And what it uses, it uses shared, shared uh, um, runtime, distributed runtime procedures. OK? So, um, and it uses macros so that you sort of say app parallelize and if you're lucky, the whole thing just gets moved to all your computers. So it uses a third paradigm. Okay. What's probably more exciting 
important to me, is that the new version is looking at shared memory access, uh, a rewriting of distributed arrays, um, and therefore you'll get genuine threading. Um, and that should be really quick. So the, that's why they keep rewriting it. We are promised we'll get 1.0 by this time next year, which is the next Julia conference. And they've formed a company. Um, so they want to make money now. <laughs> uh, and actually, they're making money. I mean, they're getting money from New York Stock Exchange. And that. So, so they are. But, but they're, they're making some big architectural changes they've on received, that side. Uh, they've received the Moore Foundation grants as well. They have, yeah. yeah. yeah Betty Moore, is it something? Yeah. $600,000. Yeah, for those who don't know, the Moore Foundation mm -hmm. is the New York-based um, mm. uh, philanthropic group. Uh, what? Uh, okay. that sort of they give large chunks of money mm. to uh, software tools that can accelerate um, science and things of that nature. Um, so Julia won an eight hundred thousand dollar. Oh, that's six hundred. Something, like yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Why did you make it a round million? I have no idea. Yeah. But yeah, well, actually, there, the, there's five guys now working for Julia Computing. Uh, the original three plus Keno Fisher, who wrote that, and a guy called and Steve Johnson. But there's actually a lot of other people, and we've got four people over here um, who are actually um, who are actually working from Simon Byrne, who is speaking here, I believe. Okay, so he's, he's and he runs a lot of Julia's stats. So all this non-linear re logistic regression. Well, he's probably speaking on that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, there's uh, Avik Sam Gupta and um, Mike Ennis. So there, there's, there's three or four people actually employed by Julia Computer in the UK, um, but, but the inner core of five people. So the original three developers are all still working uh, for Julia Computing, which is probably good. And actually, that's one of the problems you, you get. There's been a few things where they've started, and then it's died because the developers have had to make money and go and do something else, really, had to pay the bills. OK. Oh, we've got time for one more, if there isn't one more. Oh, yeah, good. So one of the points that's pointed out, which a common strategy to make compilers work faster or generally to improve performance mm -hmm. is proper type annotation. So you know yeah, what's yeah. going to be returned, you know what's going to go Which in. is what we did for the Fibonacci one, yeah. Sure. We actually said so it's an integer and block it if it isn't, yeah. When, when one first looks at improving the speed of their typing code, mm -hmm. they've got a number of options. Um, they can siphonize it, which mm -hmm. allows you to get a big speed up from annotating things and it turns it into mm -hmm. an integer representation. Um, for things like number, it's going to try and do that sort of automatic. I like the word try. I like the word try. <laughs> well, it's because it has to infer. So it's yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. One, has yeah to I love infer, it. one tries to infer. One never says, oh, I'll infer. <laughs> yeah. um, so what does Julia offer in, well, that, in that soup? Okay, well, well it was faster. easy. I mean, as a person who would say only knows the Julia, all I had to do was colon, colon, integer. Yep. And, and that was the type inference. And I had to put an assert in to say, make sure that and that was a macro that did the checking. That's it. So I can, if you actually look at proper modules, yeah. which are all online, you will find most of those are actually typed yeah. rather than untyped. So, you know. Uh, um, but untyped code, when you generate it, has, has boxing and unboxing code for shifting around because it doesn't know. So obviously, it is quicker and you generate much by about a factor of three often. You know, so so you might generate 20 lines of code instead of 60, um, but I just think it's easier. I mean, to the analyst who doesn't want to get into the technicalities, uh, then you just you just say colon colon and put the type in, and then the compiler will cough if you uh, if it doesn't oh, like it. Uh, the stack traces are lovely. Yeah. That's one thing Julia gets really right is how nice the stack traces yeah. are. When well, it's got IR traces. Oh yeah, where well, you can yeah. go to the thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where well you can actually go to the line and uh, uh, the REPL, not not I, not Jupiter, but the REPL actually is bound, so you can actually press a key and and it goes into the editor and you can find the line. So, but that's in the com in the REPL. It doesn't work. Um, there's a few things that don't work in, like you can't you can't shell to the operating system or a file completion, which you get in the REPL, but you don't get in that. Okay. All right. That's Sorry, guys, that it's run over, but... <laughs> so Malcolm will be around for the rest of the conference? I will, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you have any burning questions, or if you decide to make it your mission this weekend to learn Julia... Well, it's um, easy. It's, it's deceptively easy. De it's no, it's just easy. It's not deceptive. It's really good. The best target sale at the end is lovely. Okay. Um, then yeah. he will be around all the time. Well, I will. I will. Questions. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll break uh, for lunch. Uh, just a quick thing. I will, um, if anybody wrote down the... Think what I will do, as I say, as I will 
fill in the bits that we didn't do. Some of those, like the interactive, won't work because it won't store. And then I will push those notebooks onto the same GitHub in a subdirectory called worked examples. And I'll also change the readme to point to the slides, which are on Thingybox. Exactly.